Hello, hi, I'm John. Uh, so today we're going to talk about uh, vaccines mostly, talk a little bit about other stuff about coronavirus, but please, if you have questions, it's much more interesting for me and hopefully for you too. Uh, stop, uh, if you're here, yell out, Chuck will read it, or if you're at home, type it in the comments on the YouTube, however way you want to communicate questions, that'd be great. They can also send it to info at Chapel Pasadena. There we go. All right, so before we dive into kind of vaccines and stuff, let's take a moment here just to remember. So it's been about a year since kind of the world changed and things shut down. Um, I know at church here, we've had quite a few people that have had coronavirus, that have had family members be in the hospital with coronavirus, have family members that have died from coronavirus, have uh, been extremely lonely and isolated, um, and had a lot of side effects from the interventions that we've done because of coronavirus. So just let's take a few seconds to think and pray about uh, what's happened, to mourn with those who mourn and... Um, yeah, just a minute. Thank you. Okay, next slide. So um, I thought we'd start with a little cell biology. So if you're into sciences, great. If you're not, I'm going to try and make this as interesting as I possibly can for you. I'm thinking of you, Chuck, right yeah, here. Here you. we go. All right. So this is a basic cell, an animal cell. There's a bunch of things you see inside of it. So what the take home is, there's an outer shell, a skin. There's a center to it, a nucleus. There's a bunch of little things that have specialized uh, tasks that they do. So there's a power plant. There's a packaging system. There's a factory. Uh, all kinds of things in here. All right, that's the basic of that. All right, we're going to play a little Ant-Man. I don't know if you guys have seen Ant-Man, Marvel Comics. All right, so the average cell is 10 micrometers, so that probably doesn't mean anything to you. Uh, viruses are one hundredth the size of a cell. So if a virus was the size of a nickel, then one cell would be seven feet tall, and you, human body, about a hundred thousand cells would be the size of from here to San Diego. All right, so just think about that for a second. nickel size virus, is taking down here to San Diego's size body. So this is tiny, tiny, tiny. All right. Uh, immunology, we're going to have, this is like, this takes years and years to learn. We're going to try and do it in about two minutes. All right. So immunology is like the security system for a cell. So you think security, think uh, the army, you think like a fortress, something like that. So how does something get into and out of a cell? So there's security checkpoints. There's a lot of things that the cell looks at to see if it's going to let something in or not. Now, a cell needs to communicate with other cells. You know, there's 100,000 of them here to San Diego, and they all have to talk to each other. They all have to do tasks together. So you have to, get, you have to let something in. So it can't be a completely secure fortress. You have to have ways to get in and out. Uh, there's different ways that happens. It happens with electricity, it happens with chemicals, um, and you have to know which are the good ones and which are the bad ones. It's always trying to be invaded by something and someone else. All right, so there's a lot of security checkpoints. There's locks and keys and passageways, and some things are easier to get in than others, like we want water to get in pretty easily, and we don't want bad things to get in, like bacteria, viruses, stuff like that. All right, the cell can self-destruct. So if it decides, <coughs> I've been invaded, it's all over, I'm not going to let the thing take over, I'm going to, you know, code red on Star Trek or something, that's it. 
game over, I'm self-destructing. All right, so it can do that. Um, we talked about the door. there's doors, there's windows, there's tunnels, there's all kinds of ways to get in. There's security guards walking around outside. So these are other cells that are kind of like the big guns looking for something that's lurking around. They're always kind of floating around. There's big security guards, small security guards. Uh, they're trying to do their job. So they ask for ID all the time. If you don't have the right ID, they're going to they're gonna arrest you. They're going to put handcuffs on you, have someone else come and take you away. That's happening all the time. They remember who the bad guy is. So if they see a bad guy coming around that has like a purple nose and wears a green hat, the next time they see purple nose and green hat, all of a sudden, they start calling for backup, right? They know, uh-oh, here's purple nose, green hat guy. There's maybe some other around. We're going to call for backup. So they get more and more backup. Um, and then viral load, too. So if you get, so if you're going to attack a fortress, there's a couple ways to do it. You can sneak in, like you can do like the Star Wars, you know, one little ship getting through all the defenses thing. Or you can just completely overwhelm it, right? If you have too many ships, it doesn't matter how good your defense is. You just overwhelm the thing, right? So viral load, it tends to work like the more viruses there are, the easier it is for them to get in just because there's more of them. It's harder to, for the defense system to work. All right. So that's, I think that's enough there. Um, one more thing. On coronavirus, we talked before on the outside of the coronavirus, there's these, the corona talks about these little spikes that stick out. So those spikes are actually a thousand kind of codes long. So there's different coding system the body and cells have. Um, it's a thousand long. So that's kind of the key that tricks the lock of the cell to let it in. So if that key matches well enough, it'll go in. If it doesn't match well enough, then the cell knows it's not supposed to let it in. Okay, so any questions so far? I'm sure that's perfectly well explained. It makes a lot of sense to me, <laughs> and if you taught <laughs> science to me in high school, there's a chance I might maybe, have actually maybe listened. Maybe you'd listen. All yes. right, great. So. All right, so right now, vaccines, 70% um, of U.S. adults right now say they will get a vaccine. That means 30% will not. And the reasons um, that people most often give to why they're not Number one reason is side effects. So they heard, oh, when I get the shot, I'm going to get X, whatever it is, and they're worried about that. Okay, so we'll talk about that. Um, another concern developed too quickly, right? Wasn't this just made too fast? Shouldn't we give it more time to kind of see what's going to happen? Um, maybe I'll wait. All right, that's another thought. So it's not a hard no, it's a maybe I'll do it later kind of thing. Uh, they w people want to know how well it works. So they're not convinced that it works all that well. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. They don't know. All right. um, another reason is they've seen too many mistakes from the medical system. Uh, I don't want to update. Is that still a thing? Thank you for updating my computer you, when Apple. I at least needed you to. All right. I'll wait. Thanks. All right. Seen too many mistakes from the medical system. Uh, Yes, I mean, there has been mistakes from the medical system. So you have to determine, is this another mistake the medical system has or not, right? So I think that's, all these are fair questions. I think if you just offhand dismiss someone that has these questions, that's not, uh, that's not true. And it's not accurate, because to say the medical system has not made mistakes is not true also, right? I'll just be honest. Um, don't think I need it. So I'm, I'm fine, I don't need it. Maybe someone else needs it, but I don't need it. And then I just don't get vaccines in general. So therefore, I'm not going to get this one. All right. St. Patrick's Day is coming up, though, right? So there you go. <laughs> All right, vaccines. Uh, so this is something interesting. So I showed this a few times ago. But there, there were about 200 in development as of last summer. Um, Quite a few human trials happen. There's three approved. The EUA means emergency use authorization in the United States. So they're not fully approved by the Food and Drug Administration. It's an emergency authorization. All right. So you might say, uh-oh, wait a minute. That's not the regular path. Why are we rushing this thing? Well, the answer to that is why are we rushing this thing is, you know, it's a pretty unique situation. So uh, the three in the U.S., there's the Pfizer 
uh, Moderna and Johnson & Johnson. There's quite a few others that are working around the world. So there's one from the UK, the Oxford AstraZeneca one. Um, Russia and China kind of have their own in-house ones. The Russian one, I think, is called Sputnik. Um, awesome. Isn't that cool? I know, right. Um, so, and then uh, there's a few others around too, but I'm going to focus kind of on these three because these are the, the U.S. ones that are, are approved right now. All right, some more cell biology. Here we go. All right. So this is kind of how an mRNA works. So RNA is kind of the message system for coding proteins. So proteins are like the building blocks. So this is like the code. So inside the center of the cell, there's a library that has everything you need to know to make a body. Um, and that message goes out. The way it kind of goes out is called mRNA, messenger RNA. So the way these vaccines work is uh, a messenger RNA is made. It's kind of encased in this, in this globule of fat. So it's called a nanoparticle. Because if you just send out mRNA floating around, it's going to get broken down. It's not strong enough. It's like sending a piece of paper out in the rain. It's, it's not going to make it, right? You have to put it in a box. So the nanoparticle goes into the cell. Um, and it looks like every other mRNA. So the defense system lets it in really easy because it looks just like a message, right? It's just a letter coming in. It's packaged like every other letter coming in. So it's easy to get in, All right? So it goes in. It goes to the ribosome there, which is like the, uh, the little encoding factory. And then it spits out something. So the three things it spits out, we'll just talk about one. One is the antigen. So antigen is like basically what they did. They made this mRNA code for the little spike on the coronavirus. So it tells the cell, make a bunch of these spikes. So then the cell makes a bunch of these spikes, spits them out, and then the defense system says, hey, what are all these spikes doing around? I'm going to create a defense against these spikes. So the idea is it's ready, it's amped up, it's got all its buddies and backup ready for the, when it sees the real spike. So if the real spike comes along connected to a coronavirus, the body already knows, hey, look out for this guy. It's the purple nose, green hat one, right? Mm -hmm. Got it. So that's how mRNA works. Here's another picture of it, a little more complicated, uh, if you're interested. And there's other systems, too, going on, but that's the basic one. I think that's This would be a good time to mention that this presentation will be available on our YouTube channel after and for days and months to come. So if you miss something along the way, you can go back later and see it again. All right, so there's all these things going on. It's much more complicated, but that's basically it. Uh, here's another kind of thing, how it works. So that basically the messenger RNA comes, you get the shot, it goes in the little fat goblet, it goes into the cell, makes these little proteins. Your body creates the defense system, which is called antibodies. There's also T cells. There's a lot of defense systems that the body has. And then it sees, okay, the defense system is ready. The real virus comes along, it attaches to it neutralizes it, doesn't get in. So that's, that's the idea. So that's an mRNA vaccine. Um, this is a fairly new technology. So this has been developed over the last 20 years, and this is kind of the first time that this has been used large scale in making a vaccine. So they've been trying, trying, trying for a long time, and this is the first time it actually worked. Turns out it's pretty hard to get the little packaging right and to get it exactly right and all this, but the technology has advanced to the point where they were able to do it pretty quickly. Uh, the other kind, the Johnson & Johnson, is a little bit different. So this one, basically what happened is uh, they create a, uh, they use an adenovirus. So that's a virus that we get all the time for a cold. They modify it a little bit. It takes some DNA, puts it into a cell, the DNA is copied to make mRNA, and then it kind of does the same thing. So a couple extra steps, but they modify a regular virus that's floating around all the time that's figured out how to beat the defense system. So they use that packaging to get in, kind of. All right. This one has been around a long time. This is kind of similar to how polio vaccine has been. So that's been around for, you know, I don't know, 60, 70 years. All right, so this kind of pictures of how all that works. Um, I talked about it, so I'm not going to go into it too much. But let's just take a minute. So, I mean, I barely scratched the surface, and your head might be spinning already. This is incredibly complex, right? This is just one cell, remember? 
one cell, um, so seven foot compared to 125 miles. This happens all the time in every cell of your body. So if you are a Christian or believer, I think you should just, your jaw should drop at the amazing complexity that God has created your body with. Mm. Like it is just mind-boggling the complexity of one tiny little cell. And, you know, there's tons of these around. They recycle all the time. They're copied and, and it all works. And it's worked for so long. I mean, it's, there's nothing even close to this complexity in any human invention. It's, yeah, it's amazing. All right. Any questions so far? Thoughts? Nothing? We'll, nothing? Wait, till, we'll wait till the end. All right, here we go. Okay, so this is kind of how a vaccine gets developed. Uh, this is the pathway. It always happens. All right, so starts in a lab, right? So the lab says, hey, we got this thing. We want to make a vaccine. So first of all, what is a vaccine? The vaccine is to try and give you a little bit of something uh, so that when the real thing comes along, you're ready to get it. So the little, thi the little thing you get is supposed to not make you nearly as sick as the thing that you would get. So um, starts in a lab, more research. Then they start testing in people. There's special considerations like, is there a big emergency going on? Do we need to kind of fast track this thing? That would be yes right now. Um, can, we ma can you manufacture this? Uh, it's approved. It goes through committees. Uh, there's public comment available for all this. Then how do we prescribe it? Then how do we get out? Then also there's oversight afterwards. So there's not, it doesn't stop there. Once they approve it, it, they keep looking. So there's, for all the vaccines we have, there's this constant monitoring going on, seeing, hey, is bad stuff happening? Do we need to pull it off the market? Um, so that's kind of the pathway that it always goes. All right, all right the Pfizer vaccine. Um, I'm going to talk about this one. This is the one I got, so I did a lot of research on it because I also was skeptical at the beginning, wanting to know what they're going to shoot into my body on a fairly new technology. So I spent my time looking into it, all right? It's great with the internet. You can look into anything you want, and it's all out there. So it's, it's really nice, all right? So basically, it's that, that spike protein I talked about. Um, it has these lipid nanoparticles. That's the envelope to kind of get it in there. There's two shots, three weeks apart, um, and then it's for 16 and older. All right, so I'm going to kind of go through how the, how the trials did with the Pfizer vaccine. So the first thing they do is, once they get a vaccine, they say, hey, is this vaccine super harmful? Is it going to kill anybody? So they picked 90 healthy people, right, volunteers, and they say, we're going to give you the shot. Do you volunteer to take this unknown shot, and we'll see what happens to you? And thankfully, there's people that say, sure, I'll sign up for that. What do they get in exchange for this? Uh... Sometimes they pay them. Sometimes they, it's just people that want to advance science, and they decide, great. Okay. Just a side note, actually, in the United Kingdom, they're starting a trial now to see how much coronavirus actually makes you sick. So they're taking healthy volunteers, young, like 18 to 30, and they're putting coronavirus in their nose at small amounts and bigger and bigger and bigger until they get sick. So they're going to figure out how much you need to get sick. So there's people actually volunteering not to get the vaccine, but to get sick with coronavirus. And the point of doing that is they're going to do a challenge trial. So we haven't done that in the U.S. yet. Um, but it's basically they find out how much it takes to get you sick. Then they know that. Then they give you the shot and try to get you sick and see if it works. So that's actually the best way to test something, and it's really quick. The problem is it's considered unethical. You know, you don't really know what you're dealing with. But that is truly, like, <laughs> scientifically the best way to do it. Uh, we just have a hard time, you know. Justifying. Justifying that, right. <laughs> All right. So back to how the Pfizer one kind of went through. First 90 people, see anything really bad happens, test different doses of it. So, you know, you start with a little and a lot. And you see, hey, does anything bad happen when I give like three times as much or not? So once it gets through that, uh, then it goes to the next study. So there's, that's phase one. So that knocks out a lot of potential vaccines. Basically, it either harmed people too much or it's enough. Who cares if it works? It's hurting too many people. It's out. So 
That's also kind of comforting to me is there's like 200 that started out and there's three in the U.S. So you can see the vast majority do not make the cut. So to me, that is reassuring, right? If they're just rubber stamping everyone that kind of comes through, then I'm thinking, ah, I don't know, right? Mm -hmm. But if they're actually knocking out most of them, I know, well, at least it's gone through some process where it's good. All right. So second stage, they get you know a few hundred people. Um, and then it's, again, safety tests. So this time they get some older people, some younger people, some people with some different problems. Um, and then stage three, they get like 40,000 people. And each time they're splitting, half the people get it, half the people don't. All right? Um, so placebo basically means you give someone a shot, but there's nothing in it. And then the vaccine is like the real thing. Okay, so 40,000 people, we're going to kind of look at the 40,000 people study. So um, they look, did you get a coronavirus um, seven days after your second shot? So they compare the you didn't get anything in your shots to you got the vaccine. So this is where, if you've heard this 95% efficacy thing, this is where this comes from. So this is the stage three trial of Pfizer. Moderna's very similar results. Um, so basically it looks at everyone, it's 95%, younger people a little higher, older people slightly lower, but it's still very high, 93.7. To give you an idea, um, like the regular old flu vaccine that's given out every year is maybe, you know, 60, 70% effective, and that's considered good. So this is like, when this came out, everyone was just ecstatic in the scientific world because this is far better than anyone could have really hoped for. It's great. Great news. All right. So then uh, you say, well, what about just one dose versus two doses? Um, so remember, there's three weeks between the two doses. After the first dose, before the second dose, it's about 50% effective. Um, right after the second dose, 90%. And then a week after the second dose, 95%. So that's why they kind of say you're, you know, you're fully vaccinated a week after the second dose. That's what this means. So if you've had one, it's still pretty good. And we actually don't know if you just get one and just let it go for a while, does that number keep going higher? Because the only thing they tested is giving the second one after it. So maybe one works, we don't know. But we know two works. All right. Um, yeah, pretty consistent against all age groups, all demographic groups. So they, they basically test people with different medical problems, different races, ethnicities, age. They try and get a good sample of everybody and see if it works. So now everybody's 16 and over, so they haven't tested this on kids. The ethics of testing things on kids is even, as you can understand, even more uh, stringent, right? <laughs> um, all right, there we go. So side effects, here we go. Um, so they, they kind of look at different things on side effects. There's something called serious adverse events. So that means do you die, um, get hospitalized, or severely disabled? So basically, uh, it's pretty much this. So you look at 0.6 in the vaccine group, 0.5 in the placebo group. So something bad happened to the same amount of people that got the shot or didn't get the shot, right? Uh, so side effects, the, the serious side effects are not really there. We didn't see like, oh, people that got the shot are dying from the shot or going into the hospital because of the shot. Now, it's going to hurt a little bit probably, right? Pain is 78%. When you get a shot, I don't know if you ever got a tetanus shot, the thing feels like you got socked in the arm the next day with like a fist, right? This is probably going to feel somewhat similar. So it's going to hurt most people. Um, you're probably not going to get redness or swelling. You know, the, it says the 78 versus 50. So 15% of people that get a shot with nothing in it say their arm hurt. So that's just the needle going in, right? Mm -hmm. And then, but the actual shot does make it hurt some more. Uh, systemic reactions, fever, about a third of people are going to get fever. About two thirds are going to feel kind of crummy, fatigued. Half are going to get a headache. A third are going to get chills. And then you get some GI stuff, muscle aches. So you very well, if you get this shot, this Pfizer shot, you might get some side effects. So um, I did. I got, this is actually the one I got, especially after the second shot. I, I didn't feel too great for about a day. Yeah, you didn't feel too great either. Yeah. Um, so then you say, well, is that worth it, right? So that's a good question. If I'm, 
if I'm fine, why would I do this thing that's going to cause me pain and a fever and I'm going to feel crummy for a couple of days? So that's a good question. All right. um, so that's the kind of the study, how it comes about. So what about the real world? Um, it's kind of nice now. So when I was getting my shot, I didn't have the real world experience to look at because I was one of the first to get it. So, but right now we do have the advantage. Um, in Israel, actually, a lot of older people have been vaccinated. Like 90% of people over 60 have already been vaccinated. So that's a really good test to see, hey, does this thing work in the real world? Sometimes things can look good in studies or in the lab, and then when you actually go out and do it, it doesn't quite look the same. Um, but it seems to really have worked. I mean, there's some numbers here. So um, most of the people that are hospitalized in serious or critical condition, hardly any of them had the two shots. So it seems to really, really be keeping people out of the hospital and dying, which is basically what it, I mean, if you get sick from coronavirus, it's lame, it stinks, but it's, you know, okay. People get sick from the flu all the time, and but it's not the end of the world. But if we have a lot of people dying or going to the hospital, that's, that's kind of the big. So that's the main, the main concern of vaccines is to keep you from serious illness. If it keeps you from getting a mild illness, that's great too. But that's not the main, that's like a secondary goal. All right, so in Israel, seems to be working really, really well. Great news. This is great news again, right? So if you're a Christian, again, you can say, this is a miracle, right? Basically, in one year, um, it looks like it's really working. It's saving lives and Thank God for all these people that spend all this time in labs and studying all this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. All right, but wasn't this too quick, right? You know, a year. Actually, you know, the Moderna one, they developed it in a weekend. So basically, they cranked the thing out in a weekend, and the rest of the time has been doing all this studying and making sure it works. But actually making and developing the vaccine took a weekend. This <laughs> mind-blowing, right? Wow. Okay. Yeah. The technology's, yeah, advanced to the place where they can sequence the virus little spike. They can say, hey, what are we going to build the code against? Boom, and they put it in, and then there you go. So modified viruses like the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, uh, polio, smallpox. Uh, no one has smallpox anymore, right? Smallpox is gone. The reason it's gone is there's a vaccine. There was a vaccine. No one even needs a vaccine anymore because the disease is gone. It's been completely wiped out. All right, um, but modified viruses have been around a long time. Um, most of these vaccines didn't make the cut. So, the, you know, to me, that's a really reassuring thing. Um, technology of just vaccines in general has been around. I read the, uh, China was doing some, it's called variolation, uh, for smallpox about 1,000 years ago. So what they do is they get someone with smallpox They'd get a little thing, and then they'd kind of rub it on, somewhere, on someone who is healthy. The idea is to get them a little sick so they wouldn't die from smallpox, basically. Mm -hmm. So this has been going on a long time, this idea of vaccines. Um, the mRNA one, 20 years, kind of the technology has been developing. All right. So you say, yeah, too quickly, but also, actually, the idea has been around a long, long time. Uh, well, this is just kind of something a little bit. This is like how many vaccines have countries ordered? So this is a percentage of the population that's covered by the current orders of vaccines in the world. So the UK and Canada have ordered three times as many vaccines as they have in their whole population. So they have enough vaccines on order to vaccinate everyone three times in their country, which is kind of interesting. The U.S. has about two times, two vaccines for everyone. Now, they're not all ready yet, but they're on order and they're kind of prepaid and all this. So you can see all these countries here are the wealthy countries, right? All right, next slide. Here is the bottom of the list on how many vaccines have been ordered. You notice these are the poorer countries, right? They don't have a bunch of money to just order all these vaccines. So, as we kind of think about this, how this is going to roll out, there are a lot of people considering this. Um, but, I mean, if you're a Christian, you know, you think every life is valuable because we're all made in the image of God, not just those that are in rich countries. So um, I think 
you know, justice and all that would say, hey, you know, we need to advocate for the people that don't have this opportunity. How can we be about this as, as believers and as people who care about everyone? So this is kind of how it's starting. Um, right now, both the um, Trump administration and Biden administration have clearly stated that they want everybody in the U.S. to get a vaccine before we start giving them out to other countries. Um, so different parties, different ideas, they both agree with that. I don't know if that's the greatest idea, but that's kind of where we are. But we can certainly advocate for, you know, I would think maybe a more uh, susceptible person in a poorer country would be a better candidate to get a vaccine than, you know, a healthy 20-year-old in the United States. But that's just something to think about. All right, how's the vaccin vaccination going, right? So you, maybe you've heard in the news, you know, the rollout's so slow, it's had all these problems, you know, people aren't able to get it as quick as they can. So right now in the U.S., about 2 million people are getting vaccinated every day. It's climbing, actually, because the Johnson Johnson one just came out. But 2 million a day. We have about 360 million or so people in our country. So at that pace, you know, it just takes six months. I mean, that's not even including kit, so it'd be less. So that's pretty fast, actually. Um, and when you, you know, if you compare that to an ideal world where you say, oh, it should be faster, yes. If you compare that to the actual real world, like the U.S. is doing great. We're, Israel's really, really good. For some reason, they can just get this done. Uh, but the U.S. is kind of the only country that's not a tiny island that's vaccinating fast, right? You look at, you know, some of these European, like Norway, look at that. It's like 4%. We're up at, you know, or there at 6. We're at 20 already. So, you know, they're kind of held up by some people as a model of healthcare and public, you know, whatever. But the U.S. <laughs> actually is doing really well at, uh, at getting this out. So as frustrating as it might be that, hey, I can't get mine or whatever, if you look at the big picture, the U.S. is doing extremely well compared to other countries. Always could be better, but... Uh, yeah. All right, so one of the uh, um, kind of reasons people won't get a vaccine is say, I don't need it, right? So that very well might be true, that you don't need it. So I would, you know, I would argue maybe if you're a healthy 25-year-old, you probably don't need it. If you got coronavirus, you probably would be barely sick at all if you felt anything. Um, and so you might say, well, why am I going to get the shot when 80% of the time my arm's going to hurt and I'm going to have a fever and a headache when if I get it, it's not going to really matter to me, right? That's a fair question. So you might not need it, but your neighbor might need you to get it. So there's this herd immunity thing. Uh, you probably heard that word. So this is kind of what it means. So if you can see on the slide there, um, so someone has the disease, so like coronavirus, the red person at the top. If not many people have been vaccinated, uh, then a few people can get it. On the second one, if a lot of people have been vaccinated, that's kind of the blue people, um, the susceptible red people that haven't been vaccinated are kind of hidden by the blue people. So that's like the herd. We're all considered a herd. We're all kind of one community. If enough people have been vaccinated and the virus comes along, there's less chance of it getting to the vulnerable people. And there's some people that actually can't get the shot. So even if you don't want it and you don't think I need it, you might be helping somebody else who can't get it for whatever reason. I mean, there are some reasons you can't get it. Um, so you might be doing something kind of out of love for your neighbor that's not really going to benefit you, which is the message of Jesus, right? You Seems know. to be. It's, that's the key, right? Love your neighbor as yourself. You're supposed to think about other people. In, in America and Western culture, it's very, we're very individualized, right? We kind of analyze things. And, and when I was first looking at that, that's how I thought, like, is this going to benefit me? Why am I doing it? But then, you know, into your decision-making calculus, I think should be, well, does this benefit other people as well? So it, it doesn't have to be the only thing you consider, but it should be some, and, and I would argue as Christian, it should be a large part of what you consider when you do anything. Amen. Actually. All right, I don't do vaccines. So there are some people that just don't do vaccines at all. Um, and, you know, everyone can make their own decision. 
Um, but just looking at from pu a public health perspective, there's nothing in the history of the world in terms of public health that has saved more lives than vaccines, more lives and more kind of sickness than vaccines. So this is a, this is a comparison of uh, some diseases where in the 20th century, how many people got super sick or, or whatever or died um, from vaccines. And you can see the reduction, like smallpox, people would get sick and now nobody gets it. Polio, I don't know if you know, I know somebody that had polio as a kid. I don't know if, if you're older, you might. If you're younger, you probably don't. But it's devastating, like she can hardly walk anymore. She's getting up in age and as you get older with polio, it just gets worse. She has to use, well, pretty soon she's gonna not be able to walk at all. And only like 60 or 70, you know, so. It's a, it's a big deal, and we don't even think about it anymore because basically vaccines have come along and, and eliminated polio. So it's, some of these things, because it's not kind of in our world, we think it's not a big deal, but you know, these, this was a big deal. So you know, I, I read this quote when someone was asked, oh, when would you have rather lived? Wouldn't you rather have lived at X time ago when you know, this was going on, or you know, it's kind of idealized or romanticized? Um, I can't remember who it was, but someone basically said, I'd rather be living exactly right now because there's antibiotics and vaccines and like people don't die when they're 15 all the time. And right. it's, just, it's a very different world than it used to be. Yeah. All right, so all this you put into your decision, yes or no. So how do you make a decision on this, right? Um, well, first thing I would say you should pray, which should be what you should always do about making a decision, right? Mm -hmm. uh, seek wisdom. All right, we're going to talk about wisdom on the next slide in a little bit. Um, who are you trusting? So I've heard some people say, you know, as a Christian, I should just trust in God. I shouldn't trust in the CDC or I shouldn't trust in whatever, a doctor that's telling me or a public health person, right? So ultimately, yes, that is true in some respects. You know, our faith is in God. Our faith is in Jesus. <laughs> he is the key to eternal life, whatever. That doesn't mean he doesn't use people or things on earth to help us. For example, um, if you use that same logic on, if you drove a car today, right? You implicitly have trust in the National Transportation Safety Board that they know what they're doing, that they know how thick the gas tank should be, that there's somebody checking the car manufacturer's work, that there's somebody maintaining the road, that there's, you know, all this stuff you probably didn't even think about, but you're trusting other people who have expertise in these areas that you don't, that I don't, right? All the t you sit, you just sit in a chair, right? You, you trust that, hey, whoever made this chair wasn't just kind of loafing it the day they put it together and they didn't care and they didn't put the screw in right, because if they did, I'm dropping right to the, right? You don't even think about that. You, tr it, you trust these people. That doesn't mean you don't trust God. It just means there's also a level of trust or in the theological language, it's common grace, you know. There's common grace that goes out to people who are not believers that can still benefit you and help mankind and flourishment of mankind, right? All right. Um, facts versus opinions. So a lot of times when, when people make decisions, especially medical decisions, they... Uh, like, for example, when people are giving birth, a lot of times people will get advice from their friend, their girlfriend who just had a baby, and they'll kind of give that more weight than they'll give their OB doctor, right? This is just kind of how we operate. You know, we talk with our buddies, say, hey, what was your experience, right? And experiential wisdom does have some place in our, in our decision making, but it's become really high lately in kind of American culture. The experiential wisdom uh, has kind of um, given more weight than, than kind of expert knowledge or wisdom. So both are important, but I feel like right now we're a little overweighted in the experiential category. Um, so just a thought. Um, it's a good that, thought, John. That sometimes uh, one person's experience does not mean that is everybody's experience. Now, when you're getting a shot, right, it's kind of matters not as much what happens to everyone. It matters what happens to you, right? You might be one of the people. Now, there are vaccines that have caused problems, right? I know of somebody who got a flu shot 
and they got this thing called Guillain-Barre syndrome from it. So they're healthy 20-year-old getting a flu shot, probably would have been fine if they had the flu. Anyhow, they got the flu shot and they got this horrible disease from it, so much so that they had to be in the hospital on a ventilator for a couple months. Mm. Thankfully, they recovered. But this is a known side effect for the flu vaccine. I mean, it's extremely rare, but it does happen, right? So if you're the one person that gets that reaction, then you're going to say, hey, you know, I don't care what happened to everyone else. This happened to me. That's always true in any medicine. You have to look at what happens to everybody, but then also your own personal situation may be different or it may not be different. Um, but, you know, it's helpful to talk through maybe with your doctor or with somebody you trust, like, hey, is this a good idea for me? Um, and the experiential thing may or may not be helpful. Um, we talked about this a little before, love. Like when you make decisions, um, you know, the commandment is that we believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and love one another. The command is not just to believe, the command is to love. So love has to have some weight in our decision making. That's, that's our Lord's command. And then wisdom. So this is, uh, this is from James 3. So if you're making a decision and you or I are outside, if, we find, if I find myself making a decision and I'm outside of this, then I know that I'm outside of what, how God is telling us to be wise and make decisions, right? The wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, mm -hmm. gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. All right. So if, if those words come to mind when I'm making a decision, great. If, they, if, if I cannot say that my decision-making or my wisdom follows this, then guess where my wisdom is coming from? It's not coming from above. It's either coming from me or coming from somewhere else, right? Um, and a harvest of righteousness sown, is sown in peace by those who make peace. All right, so to me, this verse kind of, you know, hits me like a ton of bricks because often when I'm kind of disagreeing with someone or whatever, I do not have these attributes. And so I need to look at myself and say, okay, so this, this thing I'm thinking, this wisdom, maybe it's not really wisdom and maybe it's not from above. That doesn't mean you agree with everybody. That doesn't mean everyone's going to agree on the vaccine, but it does mean that we should be open to reason. It does mean that we should be impartial, sincere, um, full of mercy. So full of mercy means, why would you need mercy and wisdom? Mercy and wisdom would be because somebody disagrees with you, right? And you need to be merciful toward the other position. So that, James and God would say, is being wise. So I haven't really thought about it too much like that before, but there's clearly in the Bible this idea that we're going to disagree on things. There's also very clearly on how we should do it. Right. Yeah. All right. I think that's all I have. Okay. Well, we've got 15 minutes left, John, and uh, we've got a few questions. And so keeping in mind that we have 15 minutes left, these are going to have to be your best Reader's Digest okay. answers. All right. All right. So uh, are we going to have to get this vaccine every year like a flu shot? If so, why did I only need one polio vaccine? Mm, good question. So different viruses mutate or change at different rates. The coronavirus is, is, is a coronavirus. There's other coronaviruses, which are the common cold, and you can get those many times. So it may be that this, vex, this coronavirus, you know, COVID, whatever is going around, might change, and we might need another vaccine to try to treat it. So that's that lock and key. If our kind of defense mechanism is set up against it enough so that if it changes slightly, it still works great. If it changes too much, our defense system might not recognize, you know, purple nose, green hat guy. It might be purple nose and a little bit of different shade of green, and our immune system might not quite recognize it, and we need a little help. So that might happen. We just don't know. So far, it looks like that is not happening, but we're way too early to tell. Okay. Is there any substantial net difference between the Johnson & Johnson and other two vaccines? What are your thoughts about the two shot versus the one? They're different technologies. That's why you need one or two shots. Um, the kind of really bad stuff that happens after you get the vaccine seems to be the same. The Johnson Johnson might be slightly better at like preventing 
death and hospitalization. The other two might be slightly better at presenting mild disease. Basically, if you can get any of them, just get it. Okay. I, I would. Do you have any concerns about aluminum in vaccines? I do not. Okay. Uh, what about the vaccine and pregnancy? Yes. So that's another one like kids. Pregnant ladies is another thing. We don't want to go, you know, studying pregnant ladies and seeing does something bad happen, right? So always studies on pregnant ladies is we kind of see if anything bad did happen. So far, it seems to be, yes, go ahead and do it. Um, the other thing is, you know, if you're pregnant, you're probably young and healthy. Yes. Because you couldn't get pregnant if you weren't young and healthy. So you are probably lower risk anyway. That's one of those where I would definitely talk it over with your doctor. It's your personal situation, so I wouldn't make a blanket statement. Generally, it looks okay, but that is a decision that's not as clear in my view. Is there anything in the vaccine that should give us concern for long-term side effects? Can anything of concern show up five years from now? It could. We don't know because it hasn't been around for five years, right? So this is the question of, hey, should I just wait until whatever happens? I mean, you might be able to. Yeah, you could wait. What You could say five years. Then you could say 10 years, right? What if something bad starts to happen in 10 years, 20, 40? You don't know. So far, it looks pretty good, but um, we've had like, you know, the first people to kind of get trials on the vaccine or not even a year ago. So we, we don't know for sure. It doesn't look like anything bad's happening. Um, so at some point, you kind of have to say, all right, I'm just going to do it or not well, do it. And that's what I was, in the movie I Am Legend, they, the in theory, created this cure for cancer and it ended up spurring all these other things. And so I think people like me watch those movies and go, and it creates another level of anxiety. Like, that's really common. Yeah. And is it, is, it, is, is it common that, you know, vaccines that have been created and approved later on, you know, spin out of control and create all sorts of other problems that we didn't anticipate? Not kind of like that. But, um, you know, the first polio vaccines actually gave some people polio. So they've kind of changed it over time, and they do it a little different. So now you don't get polio from getting the polio vaccine. It did happen at the beginning where you could get a little bit of polio from. Now, that's not the technology they're using now. Um, we don't know. It doesn't seem super common. Okay. But then also, you don't know the long-term effects of getting COVID either. Right. right. We don't know. So there's all kinds of people talking about that. So it's not like, uh, hey, I'm going to be fine if I don't get the vaccine. I'm going to be fine if I get You don't. We just don't know. Okay. Um, this is uh, an anonymous question that came yes. in from somebody that we would never want to identify. Right. Why can't they create an, MRO, an mRNA code uh, to burn fat cells? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> but we don't know who sent that you in, John. Who, whoever comes up with that, they are set, let me tell you. Just yeah. seems to me like that right. would be a need that many, many people yeah. would benefit from. There you go, future scientists. Go get it. That's all our questions, John. All right. Oh, yes. Why do they say that? Yeah. So the question was, if you've had COVID, the current recommendation is to wait three months until you get a COVID vaccine, right? So if you've had COVID, uh, it depends how well or how much you've had COVID. So some people get a very mild illness. And the way the defense system works is if you kind of get a mild illness, it might not create enough uh, kind of standing army ready to combat it, right? If you got a really bad dose of COVID and you were pretty sick, then your body's probably really amped up. You got the defense. You're probably ready to go. So it's, there's a huge spectrum of people who had COVID, right? There's people that didn't even feel it to, you know, people that were on the vent and barely survived. So it's this huge range. So it's kind of a blanket recommendation uh, to wait. The reason to wait is if you just had it, you're kind of, the way your immune system works is that army is like ready to go. They are, they're fueled up, they're ready, they have all the, the armory ready. As you wait longer, it kind of Backs, it cools down the temperature. It gets, it's still ready, but it's not like fired up, ready to go. So the idea is you've just had it. 
to kind of give it some time so you get, it's called memory cells, get those developed better before you kind of test your system. Now the question is, if you even need to get the vaccine if you already had the disease, that's a question for another day. If you've probably had severe disease, you probably don't. We're still recommending everyone does it because we don't know. You know, you can measure all these immune responses, but the easiest thing to do is probably just give, give people the vaccine. Two more questions online. One is, does uh, this, uh, do we know that whether or not this affects reproductive health? Uh, it doesn't seem to affect reproductive health at all. Okay. What about the ability to travel, visit with folks, gather in large groups? How long after one is fully vaccinated? And are there any other cautions? Yeah. So, um, I mean, a lot of that's kind of a political decision and countries deciding how they want to do that. Some countries are talking about these immunity passports. So, you, you know, you get your two shots and a week later you get a card that says you can travel. So that may or may not happen. The current recommendations in the U.S. are if you've been fully vaccinated, um, then the government or the regulatory bodies consider it safe enough that you can be around low-risk, unvaccinated people. So that is like grandparents that have been vaccinated can go see their grandkids now without masks, without kind of any layer of extra protection. So that's kind of how... Comp now, the kind of the FDA and CDC and all that, they're super cautious, right? They're not going to say that if they consider that a risk, that you're going to start spreading it around. The risk is not to the grandkids. The risk is to the grandparents, right? So if they consider them fully vaccinated, so that's a week after the second shot or, you know, a couple weeks after the Johnson & Johnson, it's considered okay to kind of go about. Um, the current recommendation is if there's a vaccinated person and a higher risk unvaccinated person, um, that mask should still be worn. That's probably just being a little on the cautious side, which you could understand why that would be the recommendation. But um, the idea is not to wear masks forever, right? <laughs> so if we're, if we're trying to uh, get through this thing, the quicker people get vaccinated, uh, the quicker kind of, yeah, there'll be less of this restriction going on. Uh, this person said their, their parents had communicated to them that uh, the vaccines, or at least one of them, contains something that could cause cancer. Is this possible or true? Um, not that I know of. I mean, so the, when they give a vaccine, they not only have to give the mRNA or the little, they have to put it in something that carries it. So like the little solution that puts it in there. Um, and they test those things, you know, so there's always a worry, like, is the carrier thing that the vaccine is given in, is that harmful? So that's always like the mercury thing or the, did the shot give my kid autism or something like that. So they've studied that kind of stuff many, many times and haven't really found any evidence for that. Okay. You, know, you know, if you're an individual person and something bad happens, of course you're looking for answers, so, but, but it hasn't really shown up. Yeah. Okay. All right, I think that's all. Great, thank you. Well, I hope that helps making your decision. If you have more questions, I'm glad to kind of help you walk your way through it. But yeah, please be gracious to other people um, and, and try and keep some of these things in mind as you make your own decision. Will you pray for us today to yeah. conclude our time together? Yeah. Father, um, thank you for our time. Thank you for creating such an amazing system as our bodies and the world and thank you for people that have spent their time and lives um, doing medicine and vaccines and research um, and thank you so far that this looks like it's really worked we're grateful and we give you the glory for it and thank you that you enabled it to happen i pray that you would give us wisdom and and that that wisdom would be pure peaceable gentle open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. I confess that what I consider my own wisdom often doesn't fit into that, but I pray for me and others that, that um, you would change my heart and others' hearts so that we uh, fall into that and fall into wisdom that comes from you. Uh, thank you, Jesus. Amen. John, thanks on behalf of our church and anybody watching. Appreciate your efforts in all this, my brother. All right, thanks. Bye.